So today I will share with you not only what I know or what we know, but also what we don't, because there are very many gaps in our knowledge about these languages. Uh, I will treat uh, regional dialects together with the language family, and then in the, second, in the second part of the lecture, we will discuss the distinctive features of Judeo Berber. So some questions that we will uh, ask and answer in the first part of the talk. Who are the Berbers? I will not only speak about Jewish Berbers and Judeo Berber, but about Berber in general, because I assume not many of you are familiar with these uh, languages. Then who are the Berber Jews? Uh, whether the language can be called Berber or Mazir, the Mazir or something else. What are Berber languages and why study them? So let's start with a general question, who are the Berbers, not the Berber Jews? And some people think that the Berbers are nomadic people crossing the desert on camels and living in tents. And it's partly true, but it's not true for all, Ber all the Berbers. Most are, in fact, sedentary farmers in the mountains and valleys. And here you can see pictures of uh, uh, Berber speakers that I took during my research on uh, Berber languages and some from internet. And some of them are indeed uh, living in deserts and crossing uh, deserts on camels, but most of them are not. So Berber people are indigenous population of North Africa. And this region is known as the Maghreb in English or the Maghreb in Arabic. Uh, here you can see the map showing the Maghreb region. And in Berber languages, this region, in uh, Berber languages, this region is known as Tamazgha. It's roughly the same as the Maghreb, but it also includes uh, part of Egypt because there is a Berber language spoken there as well. And some people say that the Canary Islands also had language, a language uh, related to the Berber. The total population is estimated at around 36 million people. That's for Berber speakers, not Judeo Berber. And they live uh, in all countries of North Africa, but also in the Sahel. And of course, there are some immigrants in Europe and the United States and in Israel. About the official status of Berber, it used to be a minority language, uh, not written and not recognized until recently. But in 2001, in Morocco, the Royal Decree established the institute called Royal Institute of Amazigh Culture. And since then, Berbers or their language was acknowledged as uh, the national, as an uh, ethnic majority, as a national language of Morocco. And now IRCAM is uh, charged with the promotion of this language in education and media. Since 2011, it's an official language in Morocco. So this change is quite recent and we will learn more about it uh, in the course of this lecture. And here you can see the Berber flag with a symbol that you will also learn about in the course of this lecture. So now we turn to the question, who are the Berber Jews? There are basically two possibilities. Either they came from Israel and assimilated the Berbers, or they are Berbers who converted to Judaism. This second possibility is known as Judaized Berbers theory, and it originated in the beginning of the 20th century, and it is closely linked to the French colonialism. In particular, the scholar Nahum Schlut uh, was working in cooperation with the French colonial authorities. But there are also other scholars who didn't work with the French authorities and who adhere to this uh, theory. There are two major postulates of the theory. Uh, the first is numerous Berber tribes adhered to Judaism before the Arabic invasion. And the second postulate is that Maghrebian Jews partly descend from these Berber proselytes. So they are Berbers converted to Judaism. In reality, however, there are no arguments, whether historical, archeological, or linguistic, or onomastic, that corroborate or refute this theory. So it is speculative to say the least. Also recent studies on DNA dismiss this theory and in the publication by Behar et al, uh, Jews from North Africa lack typically North African DNA, which means they did not mix with the local population. What do we know? Uh, we know very little, but we know something. We know that Jews settled in the Maghreb, North Africa since at least third century before common era. They must have come from Israel after a stay in Egypt. And we know that there were all Jewish settlements in the Berber lands and archaeological findings uh, support this. And some claim that uh, Dihia, a female military leader, also known as Kahina in the seventh century, was a Berber Jew. 
Why we think so, some say that Kahina is related to the Jewish surname Kohen and the word Kohen, but in reality, it's an Arabic word meaning diviner. So in fact, her link to the Jews is questionable. And about North African Jews, there is very little linguistic information, uh, but we assume that they lived in the situation of multiglossia or multilingualism, speaking Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, just as their Mediterranean uh, brothers did. Then there is the Islamic period from the ninth century onwards. And in this period, Arabic must have become the principal language of North African Jews in its Judeo Arabic variant. In the 15th century, as you know, the Spanish Jews also settled, settled in Morocco. Those brought Hakitia with them. And now we turn to historical sources. Uh, there is something, but not much. In the 12th century, Aledrisi wrote that uh, there must have been, uh, since ancient times, Jewish tribes in North Africa. In the 14th century, Ibn Abi Zar wrote that at the end of the 8th century, there were two Berber tribes in the area of Fez. One of them was composed of Muslims, and the second one was composed of Christians, Jews, and pagans. And the famous uh, geographer and scholar historian Ibn Khaldun wrote that it is possible that in the past, some Berber tribes adhered to the Jewish religion. But that's all he states, and that's not enough for the Judaist Berber theory, as some think. Uh, to sum up, what we know is that before the Arabic conquest, the vast majority of Berbers were in fact Christian or pagan. And then much later, we have testimonies already from the 19th century, and they are our first evidence of Jews using Berber. Those are Jews living in peripheral regions of Morocco, Algeria, and Libya. A priest and a researcher, Charles de Foucault, wrote that Moroccan Jews mainly speak Judeo-Arabic, but in some uh, Berber-speaking regions, they also know Berber, and some might have Berber as their first language. And Simone de Ville wrote that at the beginning of the 20th century, 8% of the Jewish Moroccan population has Berber as the first language, and more can understand it compared to 76% of Moroccan Jews who know Arabic or Judeo-Arabic, and 16% for Hakitia. So now we look, uh, this is an overview of the number of speakers throughout uh, years and centuries. In the seventh century, there must have been around a few hundred. We don't really know how many. In 1912, around 8,000 in Morocco, compared to 77,000 for Judea Arabic. Or we have uh, data for 1936, 145,000, but this is very unlikely that in such a short period of time, the number of speakers increased so dramatically. So probably this second figure is not very reliable. Then in the 1950s and 60s, there was a mass immigration to Israel of Moroccan Jews, including Judeo Berber speakers. And by 1992, only 2000 speakers were left, mostly in Israel. And today we don't have numbers, but it must be around a few dozen, maybe a few hundred mostly in Israel, very few in Morocco and in France. And generally we can say that the language is severely endangered and it has been classified as moribund and ethnologue. There are different reasons of decline, uh, not only the immigration to Israel, for example, living in rural areas, the change of lifestyle, the period of French protectorate when roads were built and Berber Jews came in contact with the Judeo Arabic speakers. Then, Jewish alliance. Uh, during the period of the uh, Alliance Israelite Universelle, French schools were uh, built for Jewish children, uh, starting from 1862. Then, immigration to Israel, which I have already mentioned. And as a result of all of this, monolingual Judeo Berber speakers were rare. Here is a fun fact from the GLP website. And I highlight here that besides speaking Hakitia and Judeo Arabic and Jewish French, Moroccan Jews also spoke Tamazight or Berber. And now we will discuss the names of this language or languages. So maybe you noticed I use more or less interchangeably the terms Berber, Amazigh because there is some controversy around these terms. 
As for the term berba, it is an exonym, so a term used by outsiders. And some say it is pejorative because of its link to the word uh, barbarian or barbaroi in Greek. Then what about the term amazigh? It is endonym, so used by the population itself, but by which population exactly? Uh, it is not the term used by all Berber speakers to refer to their languages or themselves. So this term is not all inclusive, which makes it problematic as well. Then there is one specific term, takulid, for Judeo-Berber, but only in the south of Morocco. And so all of these terms are somehow problematic. It is possible to specify if one uses the term Berber that you don't mean it pejoratively. It is also possible to specify that if you use the term Amazigh, that it is meant to cover all population. But both of the terms are not ideal. And then there is some morphology. If you want to speak about the language, then in the language of the Berbers themselves, Tamazigh with the prefix t and the suffix t, or you could say with the circumfix t, t. This is the term used to refer to the language. So for me, as a person who speaks these languages, it's very strange to say Amazigh language because it's like to say Englishman language. There is a difference between English and Englishman or Spaniard and Spanish. So Tamazigh grammatically is the form which is used to refer to the language. But which language? So now we go to the question, what are verbal languages? Verbal languages belong to Afroasiatic language family. This language family includes Semitic, Cushitic, Egyptian, Chadic, and some also include Amotic. Here is the language tree, and here is the map showing the distribution of Afroasiatic languages. And now we zoom in on the North Africa. Here you find verbal languages spoken from the west of Morocco, where the Shilhita is spoken, or Shilha, and Siwa is the easternmost verbal language spoken in Egypt. There is also Zenaga in Mauritania and different Tuareg varieties in the Sahel. Now we're zooming in on the Morocco, and here there are three principal Berber languages. Uh, the southern is known as Shilha in Arabic and Tashilhit in uh, Berber language. Uh, so they refer to them to their language as Tashilhit. This is Tamazigh proper. This is the ambiguous term because if you say Tamazigh, it can refer either to any Berber language or to this one in particular. And in the north, you have Rifian or Tarifid. These are three major languages, but these are not all languages, all verbal languages one finds in Morocco. As we also have Sinhaja spoken here, Romara spoken here, and a few others. Then this Tamazigh, which they teach at schools, this is the standard Moroccan Tamazigh. And in fact, in fact, it's not exactly any of these three major ones. It's a mix or a standard version uh, based on the mix of the major ones. Then what about the Jewish Berber languages? Wherever Jews lived, they adopted the local Berber varieties. So in the south, they would speak Judeo Tashelhid or Judeo Shalha. In the central Atlas region, they would speak Judeo Tamazigh. In the north, they would speak Judeo Rifian, and we don't know much about this language variety. And maybe there was also Judeo Sinhaja, because there are remains of Jewish cemeteries in this region but we know nothing about this language. And then you also have, uh, you, or you had Jews in Algeria who might have spoken uh, Jewish Berber languages of Algeria, but again, uh, we have very little information about the languages. Here you have a map showing uh, Jews in Morocco. And once again, in the South, you find Judeo Tashelhid, here Judeo Tamazigh, the major places uh, where we have data and recordings from Atiznit and Ilir for Tashilhid, and Demnat and Tinrir for Judea Tomazir. And for the north, we have no data. So why study Berber or why study Judea Berber? Well, one can also ask why study any language? For me, any language is a key in their culture and it gives us insights in the history of North Africa or North African Jews or Judeo Berber in particular. Uh, it is interesting for linguists uh, interested in historical, descriptive linguistics, or in language documentation, or trying to stop language endangerment. It is interesting from the sociolinguistics perspective and for language contact. And it is interesting for those who are studying Jewish languages. 
It's also interesting for immigration studies. If you want to, for example, do research on present day Jewish Moroccans in Israel or the United States. And generally, if you study verbal languages or Judeo verbal languages, you do justice to the diversity because you bring a more nuanced image of the Jewish Moroccan community in Israel, for example. Uh, Berbers are also known for their artistic skills, whether visual or oral. They're famous for their jewelry, music, songs, and folklore. And of course, scientists of different uh, fields like anthropology, ethnography, musicology, and so on, can be interested in Berber for their own reasons. And of course, one can also uh, be interested to preserve cultural heritage or have personal reasons to study Berber. Uh, here are some images of uh, Berber pottery in uh, different styles and Ber a Berber carpet and the famous uh, jewelry, which was said to be produced by the Jews before their departure to Israel, but now it is produced also by the uh, Muslim uh, Berbers and the Berber couscous. Now let's look at the Judea Berber or terms to refer to their languages. Uh, first of all, there is this term Judea Berber or Judea Mazir or Judea Tamazir, but it is a recent concept and term. Uh, Berber Jews who spoke these languages never used this specific term to refer to their languages. So it's part of the reconstruction of the identity. And it's a generic term which refers to any Berber variety spoken by the Jews anywhere in North Africa. As I already mentioned, there is one specific term tapulit used to refer to Judea Berber of South Morocco, but it's not a widespread term and not everybody used it. Uh, the addition of Judeo or Jewish before Berber normally should imply that this language has distinctive features, but is this so? Now we're going to the second part of the presentation and here we will discuss if Judea Berber has distinctive features. But before we discuss distinctive features of Judea Berber, I will also introduce some general features of Berber languages because you might be not familiar with them. Uh, first, a note about transcription. If you see a dot under uh, a character, it means that the uh, sound, uh, the consonant is emphatic or pharyngealized, as in Arabic, ta, and the underscore indicates parentization, for example, th. And here you have correspondences between the symbols used in Berberological literature and the International Phonetic, phonetic Alphabet. Uh, please pay attention to these two, as we're going to speak about them later on, sh and j. And these two can be used interchangeably in transcriptions, sh and r. Uh, this is just for curiosity. If you have Moroccan friends, they might use numbers to uh, represent some sounds which do not exist in uh, English or other European languages. For example, three stands for ein, uh, six for ta, and nine for a, because of the resemblance with the Arabic script. So what about Judea Berber phonology? Um, in some varieties, though not in all, there is a shift of s to sh, which I indicate with the symbol highlighted in yellow, and there is a shift of z to j, which I indicate with a second symbol highlighted in yellow. For example, the original sbr, the patient can be pronounced shbr, asfalu became ashfalu, ahedush uh, from ahedus, and so on. For z, which turned into z, we have anjur, we'll see, yujin, he sent, jin, beauty. Uh, some verbal varieties, Judea verbal varieties, lost labelized wheeler score. So, for example, the word for we pronoun instead of nikuni is pronounced nikni. Uh, some verb varieties, once again, uh, have a shift of a to k and da to t. For example, lakl instead of lakl, brain. But all the examples I have seen are Arabic loan words. So, probably they are all uh, borrowings from Judea Arabic. And the switch is not necessarily true for native verbal words. We also find the shift l to n in some varieties. So words like wano from walu, nothing, kunu from kulu, all, and the centralized pronunciation of the three verbal vowels. Uh, to summarize the features of phonology, 
Uh, some of these phonological features are shared with or potentially borrowed from Judeo Arabic. Not all these distinctive features are found in all Judeo Berber varieties, so don't be surprised if you do find labelized phonemes or if you do not find the merge of s and sh and so on. Also, I have to emphasize that within Berber languages, even non Jewish, the variation is already quite large, and you can find Muslim Berber varieties that like Lebe Villers and so on. So it is not necessarily always a feature of Judea Berba varieties. And indeed, some features of the so-called Judea Berba may be found in non-Jewish varieties, for example, in parts of Tinrir. Now we're going to look at uh, morphology. We will start for with the morphology, which is common for Muslim and Jewish Berba. There are two major lexical categories, verbs and nouns. And there are no adjectives, so instead they use quality verbs and quality nouns for qualification. Uh, let's look at the verbs. Uh, the verbs have subject affixes to mark the person number gender of the subject. They have uh, three aspects. Some also distinguish negative aspects, and they have prefixes that derive passives and causatives. And here are some examples. So to express he bought, to mark third masculine singular, you use prefix e, is ha. To say I teach, you say salmad with a suffix r. And to say you, plural left, you use the prefix t in combination with the suffix m, tvra, tvar. Uh, just a quick mention of what a verbal complex is. The verbal complex is a verb with clitics and particles. Uh, clitics can be pronominal, direction toward the speaker known as ventive, direction away from the speaker known as eentive. And these clitics can change position depending on the syntactic context. For example, wind they brought with the d following the verb, or urdu win they did not bring with the d in front of the verb. This is for both Jewish and non-Jewish verba. Now we'll look at the nouns. They mark gender and number. There are two major classes of nouns. The first class has verb morphology. It has verb prefixes and it marks state. So for example, for masculine singular, we have argas and the annexed state is urgas. For plural, we have irgazen, men. For feminine, we have prefix t and the suffix t like in the word tamazicht and here tamhart, woman and for plural, timari, women. And there is also a big second class of nouns. They have Arabic morphology and they preserve the Arabic article l, which doesn't have the meaning definite as in Arabic, it's just always present. So we have lhal, situation, rimsakin, poor people. And as I said, for qualification, there are no adjectives, but instead there are quality verbs and quality nouns. How does it work? So quality verbs express events, but they also describe properties. They distinguish aspects like regular verbs, and they mark person, number, gender, like regular verbs. So they're conjugated. Imillul, it is white. Timillul, she's white. Ar itimlul, it's becoming white. Quality nouns have morphology of regular nouns, but they can be used attributively. So for example, the word for white one is amlil, masculine, tamlil, feminine, in Lilian, plural, team Lilian, feminine plural. So what about Judea Berber morphology? Well, it is basically the same as non-Jewish varieties. And there are, of course, some Hebrew loans. They can belong to class two nouns, so with Arabic morphology, which means that they potentially could have been borrowed through Judea Arabic. Examples include Milá, circumcision, Al-Qabura, tombs, Al-Me'ara, cemetery, al destruction of the temple. They can be also Berberized or integrated into class one with the Berber affixes. For example, Lashon becomes talu, Talasud or Talashud, meaning Hebrew language in this case. Chochma becomes Tachochmid, wisdom, and Kohen has a Berberized version, Takwahnid, a verbal noun being Kohen. Uh, probably there are also some non-integrated loans, and I would wish, I wish I had examples of the ones who can retain Hebrew plural, but I haven't seen any examples in the texts I have read and the songs I have listened to. 
uh, one word which hasn't been integrated into class one or class two is the word parao for parao, but it's only attested in the singular. A brief look at the syntax. Uh, Berber languages have flexible word order, which can be verb, subject, object, subject, verb, object, etc. And as I already mentioned, the verb can have clitic pronouns, which can change position depending on context. Judeo Berber languages generally have the same syntax as non Jewish Berber varieties. But of course, if we have written religious texts, then Judeo Berber can have a distinct syntax. Namely, there are calc translations from Hebrew or a mix of calc and regular syntax. And in some texts, we also see influence of Judeo Arabic syntax. Now, regarding lexicon and semantics, Again, lexicon is shared with the non-Jewish Berber varieties. And in fact, Jewish and non-Jewish Berber languages are mutually intelligible. There is no evidence of a secret language, unlike for Judeo Arabic. Uh, there are some Hebrew words referring to Jewish cultural life. We have already seen Lumila and uh, Talasud. And there are proverbs and sayings, most of uh, which are shared with the local Berber proverbs which can be pronounced with the Jewish pronunciation. So, imik simik eskshim uram agdur, little by little the camel enters the jar, is a Berber proverb used by Muslim Berbers and by Jewish Berbers. But there are also calc translations of biblical Jewish expressions, and of course, some references to the Jewish culture as expected. Now, maybe there are distinctive features in the writing systems. So let's look at them. Before we discuss how Judeo Berber is written, maybe it's useful to say about how Berber languages are written. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term Tifinagh, but Tifinagh is one of the scripts used to write Berber languages. It is descendant from the Libico Berber or Libic script, uh, tested in the first millennium uh, before Common Era. It's an abjad, meaning it's a consonantal writing system without vowels. And we find inscriptions from North Africa and the Canaries. Later, the Libic script died, but uh, it's the, it died in the north and spread into the Sahara, where it evolved in the Tuareg Tifinagh. So we have two different Tifinaghs, the Tuareg Tifinagh, or traditional Tifinagh, which is still an abjad, and then the new Tifinagh, which added vowels, and it was developed in 1960s by the Académie Berber, Berber Academy in Paris. It is basically Tuareg Tifinagh, originally adopted to write Kabyle, but later modified and adopted for use across North Africa. Here you have inscriptions in Libeco Berber in, from Algeria and here from Morocco. And this is the new Tifinagh, which IRKAM, the Royal Institute of uh, Amazigh in Morocco, uses to promote the standard Tamazigh in Morocco. So here is this symbol, uh, Z, which you found, which you find in the Berber flag. Here are some books recently published in Neo Tifinagh. And here are the signs in three different scripts, uh, Latin, Arabic, and Tifinagh, which you can find in if you travel in Morocco or Algeria. So writing Berber includes different scripts. Tifinagh, which is the official script, it has a symbolic value. It can be argued to be the emblematic for. Uh, Berber identity. You have Arabic script used by those who are literate in the Arabic language. You have Latin script used by linguists, writers, and intellectuals. And of course, sometimes Hebrew script used rarely for Judea Berber. Each script is associated with a specific ideology. So for example, for the Arabic script, you can argue that it's used by those with Islamic orientation the Latin script used by those with a Western or maybe French colonial orientation, a Hebrew script used by Jewish minority, literate in Hebrew, and Tifinagh, which was chosen as a sort of neutral script or a compromise, but at the same time, it can be argued that it's prevent, it prevents the spread of Berber when Berber students have to already master the Arabic script and the Latin script. However, generally, Berber languages are not written. They are rarely written, and this is true for Judea Berber as well. Berber languages are said to belong to the so-called oral culture, which is different for Arabic or Judea Arabic. Here is another uh, fun fact from the GLP website. It says that since speakers of Berber often preserved their languages only orally, 
There are very few texts in this language. One of the first Judeo-Mazikh texts discovered utilized the mix of Hebrew, Judeo-Mazikh, and Judeo-Arabic. And in the 1970s, revitalization efforts resulted in the publication of a Judeo-Mazikh translation of the Passover Haggadah. Here you have this uh, uh, Ex, uh, ex, uh, extract from the Passover Haggadah, published in 1970 by Galan Pernet and Safrani. It is one of the three versions of Pesach Haggadah, uh, the first one published and the better known one from Tinrir. And the question which arises is, is it a traditional translation? And the answer is no, it is not uh, spontaneous or traditional. It was commissioned in the 1950s as part of revitalization of Judea Berba. And it's not certain that uh, speakers of Judea Berba used it. There is also a second version. It was commissioned in Morocco from Rabbi Masoud Ben Shabbat in the late 1940s, uh, which you probably read about in uh, Shetrit. And there is also a third version commissioned later in Israel in 1994 from Yehuda Tarei, uh, which came, who came from the Sus region, mentioned also by Shetrit. Uh, to sum up, the whole Haggadah was never translated in Judea Berber, and the speakers always emphasized that they didn't use these written texts. Uh, they used Judea Berber either orally or they used Judea Arabic texts. This is uh, except from the second version. So regarding writing Judea Berba, we can say that there are no independent literary works. There are very few written texts that can be considered exceptions. Instead, we we'll find oral literature shared with the Muslim Berbers. Some songs and tales are still found in Israel, for example, genres Ahidush, Ahuash. Uh, the language was used mostly for daily communication, it could have been used as a, for, explain, for explaining religious texts orally, and there were some prayers recited in Berber. Now we turn to sociolinguistic variation, favorite topic of some of you, as I know. So besides regional variation, we also find sociolinguistic variation. First of all, it's important to know that Jews of different regions of Morocco identified themselves as belonging to different tribes, as Berbers did. And most Berber Jews, as I mentioned, were bilingual in Berber and Arabic. There were two principal situations. Either Berber was their first language, and women and children knew Berber better than Arabic, or Arabic was their first language, and they knew Arabic better than Berber. The history of the community is linked with the language, and as a result, the language could be more or less similar to the local Berber varieties. There are many different factors that can influence the language and its distinctive features, such as bilingualism, proficiency in Judea Arabic, exposure to the local Muslim Berber, life in the Milah or the Jewish quarter if there was one, existence of a Jewish school if there was one, the study of Hebrew texts, and so on. Generally, the immersion in the Jewish life influenced the language. So, for example, the use of Jewish concepts, uh, Talmudic references, Hebrew loans, and so on. Uh, Hebrew loans prevail in the written language, and it is possible to hear a Judea Berber song, which has no Hebrew words at all. Uh, also, it is important to realize that linguistic distinctive features are linked with the media. So, uh, they are found mostly in the written form, but only if there is written literature and they are found in the oral form if Jews led a separate segregated life different from their Muslim brothers. However, there was not always a written literature and there was not always a separate Jewish community in rural Morocco. Therefore, it is not so surprising that Judea Berber has less distinctive features that distinguish it from non-Judea Berber or Muslim Berber than, for example, Judeo Arabic. Now we go to contemporary status or other documentation. As you heard previously in other lectures about vernacular and post-vernacular, let me remind here that vernacular language is the one used as means of communication, while post-vernacular is a language not used in daily life, but learned to connect or reconnect with one's heritage. An example could be Yiddish in the United States for some speakers. So what about Judea Berber? 
For today, wherever there is little post vernacular engagement among younger generations, what we find instead is documentation by linguists, often outsiders like me, musicologists and filmmakers. So there is the mother tongue project, there is a musicologist and musician, Milena Kartovsky-Ayash, which you heard in the beginning of this uh, talk, and the filmmaker, Kamal Hashkar, whom you might know uh, if you watch the movie Tsinghir uh, Jerusalem. Here are some images of people interviewed and recorded by the mother tongue website and Milena's photo on the bottom right. I uh, included the links to Judea Tashelhit recordings from the website, so, but we don't have time to listen to them all. So you are invited to click on all these links after the talk. And I will play for you one of these recordings, the second one by Esther Peretz mentioning Ben Gurion. So not this one, this one. La 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 dai, la 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 li. Anait le mushab, al akhira ghalani. Ma tishat lakh sadok, or tiri yani. Ma tishat lakh sadok, or tiri yani. Ahalakh ya. موسيقي <تصفيق> الزور لك بيش ولا الضو ولا التاني فوري آه هني الملك دي نتان ستسعيني كلا دار زي كلا دارك ايام ما سني وسي آه لا 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 So that was one language sample, I will skip this one. And then uh, there are also Judeo Tinghir recordings or so recordings from Tinghir from a private collection by Milena Kartovsky Ayash and Kamal Hashkar, uh, which I analyzed and uh, transcribed for this lecture. Uh, you can listen to them later. We listened to Asfalu at the beginning of the lecture. What I have to say about these recordings is that in today, Tinghir recordings will find distinctive features, but also the speakers were fluent in Judeo Arabic. While in Judeo Tashelhit recordings, there were no distinctive phonological features or syntactic features. And the only uh, part which made the recording Jewish was a reference to Ben Gurion. So we will not listen to this recording. And then uh, you know that Milena made Milena made an artistic musical video, she based uh, her own version of the song on the original recorded with uh, the Judea Tenghir speaker. So instead of conclusions, let me first summarize about regarding the recordings once again. They show how Jews adopted local cultural practices. These songs are part of the local Berber poetic tradition, and they show diversity of Judea Berber languages representing a continuum of distinctiveness. The recordings from in Judea to Shilhid, they have hardly any distinctive features and they are very easy to understand for non-Jewish non Shilhid speakers. The recordings from Tinrir show distinctive features mainly in phonology, the merge of S and Sh, of Z and Z, but they are also mutually and, uh, intelligible with the non-Jewish speakers. Then the question about these distinctive features, um, there are two questions. Are these features transferred from Judeo-Arabic? Because the speakers were fluent also in Judeo-Arabic. And can we say that distinctive features transcend language borders? Uh, some more notes regarding distinctive features. judeo berber generally is very close to the local Berber varieties. So there are not many distinctive features distinguishing it from Muslim Berber. When written, Judea Berber also has distinct syntax, namely calc translations from Hebrew. However, it is rarely written. So we have 
two reasons of the lack of distinctiveness. First of all, that it's rarely written, and usually distinct syntax is limited to written texts. And second, proximity of Jews and Muslims in rural areas, which is different from urban areas in Morocco. However, uh, Judeo-Berber can still be classified as a Jewish language due to its sociolinguistic and cultural features. If you define a language as Jewish language, if it's spoken by the Jews, then Judeo-Berber is part of the Jewish languages. If you have to remember only one thing about, from this lecture, then it's the following. There are as many distinct uh, Berber and Judeo-Berber varieties as there are people in this photo and as many sub-dialects as there are people in this photo, and they all may behave differently uh, depending on what feature you're interested in, whether it's distinctiveness or their behavior in phonology or morphology or syntax or lexicon. 